1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to be looking at the first 18 verses of this chapter. And tonight's message, I've entitled it, The Great Escape. The Great Escape. You're going to see in a moment, as we go through this text, why I call this The Great Escape. But we're going to be looking at the first 18 verses here of 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm going to read pretty much, probably I'm just going to read up to verse uh, 10, even though we're going to go beyond that, but just to kind of introduce the text. Uh, Chapter 19 of 1 Kings, it says, And Ahab told Jezebel that Elijah, what Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one, uh, of, of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Then he looked And there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. I heard of a Christian woman who, who said, My favorite verse in the Bible is the one where it says, And it came to pass. Now, when she told people that, they asked her, how could that be your favorite verse? Well, she responded and said, because I know that no matter what happens, even as bad as it gets, it hasn't come to stay, it has come to pass. Let me ask you a question. What's your feeling about your future? What's your feeling about the future? You know that one survey showed that most American adults are facing their future with doubt and fear, not with a feeling of invincibility, but with a feeling of vulnerability. Life on this side of heaven can be a bummer at times, right? I mean, it it, it stinks sometimes. You know that. I mean, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you're going to come out depressed after that, right? Because Solomon is all about negative things and how life is under the sun and all that. But on this side of heaven, we will have moments of fear, moments of discouragement that will cause us to feel discouraged about the future. And it's interesting because one of the things that Billy Graham said, and I want to quote what he said, he said this, the Christian life is not a constant high. I have my moments of deep discouragement. I have to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, oh God, forgive me or help me. Billy Graham. It's like, really, Billy? You have prayers like that? Well, it's interesting because we all love mountaintop experiences when it comes to God, right? For those of you who are wondering, what do you mean, mountaintop experience? You mean Mount Baldy? No, no, I'm not talking about that. This is a cliche Christian thing we'd say, you know, Moses on the mountaintop. A, a mountaintop experience is that experience where everything is falling into place for you. Your relationship with Jesus is like right there. It's like you could call down from fire from heaven. You're like, I'm, I know I'm going to get it if I do that. I mean, it's, you're so close. You're walking like, man, this is, God has just been just pouring out his love, pouring out his grace. It's a mountaintop experience. And there are moments like that, but if you've been a Christian for a long time, you know that you're going to come down from that mountain eventually, right? You know that. I mean, I would love to stay up on a mountaintop experience. I would love to just be up there and stay there. I mean, in fact, right now, this week, I'm having one of those. I mean, I walked on what? No, I didn't do that. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but, 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 but I'm having one of those moments where God's like, oh, man, Lord, this is amazing. This is so cool. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, I got to come down from this soon. And if you remember, when Moses came down from his mountaintop experience with God, what did he find? The children of Israel engrossed in some nasty stuff, right? They were in sin. 
that discouraged Moses. That got him upset when he saw the things that were going on. How do you think he felt about the future and the future of God's people? Lord, I'm not going to continue with these guys. Look what they're doing. There's no future here with, you know, I mean, these guys are going nowhere. Look what they're into right now. How can I see a future as your leader, God, with people who are doing this stuff? I mean, his future must have been pretty sad. But what we're looking at here, it's interesting because we're going to look at a story about a man. And it's not just a man. We're talking about a man of faith. In fact, more than just a man of faith. I'm talking about a man of bold faith, a man of confidence in his walk with God. I mean, when you look at the Bible and you read the, book, uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, he's popular in the Bible. I mean, he's mentioned in Scripture the things that God did through his life. In fact, in the New Testament, there were these brothers that tried to copy what he, what he did. Uh, James and John, remember when Jesus was walking through the Samaritan village and they rejected Jesus? What did James and John want to do? Call fire down from heaven to barbecue those people that rejected Jesus. Remember that? Lord, let us get, you know, let's just crispy them up, you know? Crispy cream right here. Let's do it, right? What did Jesus say? Hey, listen, you, your attitudes are bad. I didn't come here to destroy lives. I came here to save lives. Stop that, guys. Who were they mimicking? Who would they want to imitate? Elijah. And this is the person that we're going to be looking at. And we're going to be looking at what I'm calling Elijah's great escape. And we're going to apply this to our lives. Because I believe this is a very powerful portion of Scripture. Elijah, who was a man of great faith, all of a sudden collapsed because of fear and discouragement. A man of faith. Uh, he wanted to call it quits. He wanted to just, just throw in the towel. And maybe there's some of you here tonight that you're, you're ready to just quit right now. You're, just, you're on the verge of calling it quits. You're saying, I'm about to quit. After this service, man, I'm going to quit. Well, let me see. Don't do it yet, okay? I want to encourage you. God is going to change all that up for you today. But I'm sure there are a few of you here that have thought about quitting because life gets so hard. But let's look at the first three verses of chapter 19. Let's look at the problem here. What is the problem with this big man of faith? Why did he leave? Why did he run away? Well, listen. Look what it says. It says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had ex executed all the prophets with the sword. Now, Abraham, or I'm sorry, Ahab comes to his wife to report some news to her. Now, who is Jezebel? I mean, you don't really run into people by that name, right? I can't wait my first kid, Jezebel. And if it's a boy, Judas. Could you imagine that? That's weird, huh? I honestly expect the Antichrist to have babies, like that, right? Yeah, he's going to be naming them Jezebel and Judas. Anyways, that's probably not true. But who is Jezebel? Jezebel is one of the most intriguing women in the Bible, an evil yet strong-willed creep. That's right, creep. She was the model of what a contentious woman is. For example, Proverbs 21.9, Solomon said, Better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. You know Solomon knew what's up, right? Because he probably had a lot of contentious women among those thousands, right? So, so he's an expert. You can't let, oh, you don't know. You've never been married. Yes, I, a thousand times, buddy, you know? <laughs> so he knows. Well, Jezebel was the wicked witch of the West or the wicked witch of Israel. She was so bad. She was a Phoenician princess who worshipped Baal, the pagan god of fertility. She married King Ahab of the northern tribe of Israel. And she persuaded him to tolerate her paganism. And that's how it seeped into the tribe there, the northern tribe. And all of a sudden, they began to worship this god. And I find it interesting because she persuaded her husband to do this. Here is a man who was supposed to represent God. And then here's a woman who wasn't representing God. Doesn't the Bible warn us about being unequally yoked? Right? Well, why God? I mean, he's, he's cute. He, he does come to church with me. I know he doesn't open his Bible, but, but still, he's willing to come. Hey, listen, you take a chance and you missionary date. It doesn't always work. And if you go into that, you're going to get thrashed spiritually because you're going to compromise. Ahab 
had no backbone. She took that role. And she basically, when she married Ahab, she emerges as the power behind a throne. So Jezebel, who hated the worship of Yahweh, worship of God, she introduced this Baal worship. Now, what is this Baal worship? Well, Baal worship was the worst sin against God, similar to today's Christians embracing Satan. It's like if a Christian embraces Satanism, right? They're like, wow, that's bad. Well, that's exactly what Baal worship was among the children of Israel. It was, a, that was not a good thing. And the worst thing is that King Ahab began to protect this worship. He began to protect it, and he began to encourage the tribe to go and worship Baal. So what happened? Well, God got a little upset, and God inflicted a three-year drought in the land. He says, you won't get no rain now. Your crops are going to die. You will have no food. Here's where Elijah comes in. Elijah is fed up with the children of Israel's nonsense. Their sinful ways. In fact, in chapter uh, 18 of uh, 1 Kings, verse 21, if you turn there real quickly, look, look, at the, look, look what he did. He basically came to settle the question of who is supreme, God or Baal? And this is what he says in verse 21 of chapter 18. How long will you people falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. The prophet Elijah devises a contest on Mount Carmel to prove who's the real God. Is it Baal or is it God? And whichever deity can set a fire and destroy the sacrificial bowl that they're going to put on this altar by divine intervention will be acknowledged as the true God. That was, that was the, the, the actual uh, uh, test, the challenge that he had. It reminds me of what Joshua did when Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land. And he came to the, the, the last chapter of Joshua 24. Joshua, who was renewing the covenant, reminding all the children of Israel, say, hey, don't forget what God had done in your life. Don't, don't forget what he did, how we got here. And then he says this to them, very bold of a good leader. He said this, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Pretty cool, huh? I hope you've made that choice in your house to say, you know what, I don't care how many people are saved in this house, we are going to serve God here. I don't care if we have neighbors that come in this house that don't know Jesus or relatives or whatnot. You know what, this house is a house serving God, and they'll know it. I don't have to put away my Bibles because somebody's coming over. Listen, this is a house that serves the Lord. You make that choice. So Ahab comes to, to his wife. Uh, once this all happened, I mean, God proved himself to be the true God. Uh, fire came down, consumed the sacrifice, and all of a sudden, the people were like, okay, you're God, you're God, you're God, you know, if we believe you're the one. And then 400 and some prophets were killed. So now here comes Ahab with some good news and some bad news. So he comes, honey, yes, I got some good news and bad news. Okay, what's up? What's, what's the good news? It's raining. It rained. The drought's over. Okay, what's the bad news? Your prophets are dead. What? Yeah, your prophets are dead. Look what she says, verse 2. She sent a messenger to Elijah, and she said this, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. The news did not sit well with Jezebel. She got furious that her prophets were killed. Basically, God won, she lost. She was mad. Anytime you go against God, you're going to lose. Okay? You, you want to write that down, want to tattoo it, whatever. Anytime you go against God, you're going to lose. Ask Jonah. Ask Judas. Right? You read Judas. He went against Jesus. He lost. Jonah thought he could hide from the presence of the Lord. He lost. And there's other stories in Scripture that show that you cannot win. You're done. Well, Jezebel lost. And Elijah now has a choice. And notice in verse 3 what he chose to do. When he saw that he rose, he ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. I mean, he said, see ya. Hey, buddy, I'll be back. You could stay back. And he left his servant behind. What baffles me is this. 
God had just done an amazing work in chapter 18, right? I mean, he saw the spectacular. God proving himself to be the only true God by consuming that sacrifice. He saw an amazing work of the Lord. And all of a sudden, he collapses by fear over this creep, right? Jezebel. What's going on here? Well, what happened is this. Is Elijah took his eyes off the Lord and he put them on his circumstances. Because if you notice what it says, when Elijah saw. Anytime you and I take our eyes off of God and we put them on our circumstances, we're going to sink. And we're not going to make it. Because sometimes our circumstances are so huge. You remember Peter. What happened to Peter? When, when Peter said to Jesus, if that's you, Lord, when he was in the boat, uh, you know, have me come to you. And she says, sure, come. And Peter made it clear. He says, on the water. Jesus said, come. What did he do? Start walking on water, right? And he's walking. And I guarantee you, he was staring at Jesus as he's walking. I would, because I'd be like, I'm going to look at you, right? And he's walking on water, and he's walking, walking, step by step. And all of a sudden, his eyes go to where? The wind and the waves. And then when he saw the winds and the waves, the Bible says he began to sink. That's what happens. The waves and the winds of life, when they hit us, if you start looking at those winds and waves, you're going to go sink just like Peter. But praise God, you can call out to God and he'll bring you back up. This is what happened. This is what happened to, to Elijah. Elijah, he was at the highest point in his life with God. The enemy stepped in and knocked him off the path. And that's what will happen. When we are at our highest point in our life with God, the enemy will want to come in and knock you off that path. Now, I'm not saying that that's the only time Satan attacks you is when you're up in that mountaintop experience. He'll attack people across the board. If you're a backslider, he's attacking you because he's trying to keep you there. But when you are at the highest point in your life with God, the enemy hates it, and he will try to knock you off that path. Remember, even our own Jesus, before he started his public ministry, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Guess who showed up? The Satan to tempt him, to knock him off his course. But it didn't work, right? God won. Satan was no match. And it's important for us to understand this because this is something that we have to understand as Christians is that the enemy is after you daily. Uh, 1 Peter 5.8, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Not push, not slap you in the back of the head. He wants to chew you up. He wants to kill you because he hates Christians. And anytime you begin to develop that relationship with Jesus in, in a wonderful way and it becomes very strong, the enemy says, I don't like that. I want to bring them back to the way they were. I don't want them to get their Bibles out anymore. This is, this is ridiculous. And this is what happened to poor Elijah. Elijah saw the spectacular display of God's mighty power. And you would think that that experience would have made him bold and confident to laugh at Jezebel's, you know, threat. Ha, <laughs> ha, right. I'm going to burn you up too, you know. But it didn't happen that way. And, and we see here, instead, he became discouraged, afraid, because he was looking at his circumstances. You know, what's interesting is that Elijah was a man of God. He was a man of God, and yet he still struggled with fear, and he began to run away from the situation there. And some people will look at a man like this and, and they'll say, well, wait a minute. Isn't he supposed to be a man of God? Aren't man of God, men of God perfect? Aren't you a leader at a church? You're, you're dealing with fear? Maybe you're not saved. No, it's not true. We're human. Uh, we still go through discouragement because we're all in it together. The difference between you and me up here is that I'm up here, you're down there. I mean, we're all human beings. We all get hit with the same trials sometimes. And Elijah is no different. And the Bible even says that. Listen to James 5, 17. I love this. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Isn't that cool? And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Elijah was used by God in a powerful way, but he is just like you and me, a fallen human being with weaknesses. You see, it's Christians that put pastors and leaders on pedestals. It's not the pastor and leader that puts them on a pedestal. They don't put themselves. It's the people 
that will put them up on that pedestal. And then when they fall, you're like, whoa, what's going on? You're supposed to be a pastor. You're supposed to be a leader. You, you, you. Listen, people have weaknesses and struggles. You just don't know. And, and even Billy Graham, I shared that, that, that scripture with you or that quote. I mean, even he has his struggles. I mean, we're all human beings. And of course, I'm not saying this is to give us a license to sin and do what. No, I'm not saying that. I'm talking about reality here that Elijah was a man just like you and me, uh, just a human being. And yet he struggled with fear, discouragement, and that just sent them over the edge. Elijah's problem, notice when he went in there, he went to Beersheba. But, but, but Elijah, who is just a man like you and me, and I love this part what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. If you guys actually turn there with me, 1 Corinthians one twenty six, there's something here that I want to add to the, the, the frailness or the, the imperfection that leaders uh, have and dwell with. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, even God himself knows that there are no super saints in the kingdom of God. And no one is perfect and no one has the ability to walk on water without God's power, of course. But first, uh, cha- first Corinthians 2, 26, you guys are probably familiar with this. But this is, this is what it says in first Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, nor, nor, uh, not many noble are called. But God has chosen what? The foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. And then he says that no flesh should glory in his presence. Isn't that amazing? If you get offended by that, I'm sorry. You're not fit to be a leader in the church. You're like, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm somebody, you know. Well, stay where you're at, you know. You're going to get puffed up and you're going to fall. But we see here that Elijah was, was, a, was a man, a, a human being like you and I. And where does he go? He goes to Beersheba. You know how far Beersheba is? He actually went about 100 miles way south into empty desert. He just took off. He just booked and went out into the desert. Was probably wasn't even thinking, or maybe he knew where he was going. But he went to no, he went to no man's land. He went to the boonies, I guess, if you will. But Elijah's problem was not that he arose and ran, or went down to the desert to hide. It was that he did it without God's direction. He did it without God as his primary shelter. You don't see Elijah here praying, say, "God, what do I do? Which way do I go?" What do you want me to do? What's your will in this, Lord? Jezebel wants to kill me, so what do you want me to do now? He didn't, he didn't consult God. He just took off. He just left. And he sought sh- shelter in a barren desert. That tells you how discouraged he was. You know, the Proverbs says that the Lord is, the, is a strong tower, right? The righteous run into it, and they are what? Safe. Well, Elijah didn't think about that. He thought the desert was safety. And you're going to see where he goes to get comfort. But as Elijah takes off, in verse 3, he arose, went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, left his servant there. We see that the first three verses deal with his problem. Now we get to see God's grace. Verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. He says, it is enough. He thought it was all over. He was tired of traveling. His mind was concerned about his life. His future looked very bleak. He was a hopeless man. And he found a broom tree. And they say broom trees are desert bush that grew to a height of about 10 feet. I have a picture of one. If you guys pull it, that's a broom tree. It's in my backyard. I'm joking, it's not. Um, this This is an actual broom tree in Israel. There isn't much shelter under there. And that's desert. It probably was hot. But he kind of somehow went underneath that bush, and he just tried to seek comfort in a broom, uh, in a broom tree. Your Bible might say juniper tree. It's the same thing. But we see that Ju- uh, Elijah goes to this tree, and why is Elijah there? Let me tell you why. Elijah misinterpreted his circumstances. You see, Elijah expected Jezebel to surrender. After seeing this spectacular display of God's power, Elijah probably thought, you know what? She is going to surrender right now. Watch. She's going to melt. 
Instead, she went against them. She opposed them. And he's like, okay, this is not good. So he misinterpreted his circumstances, and that led him to this desert. And it's interesting because as he interpreted this difficult situation in his life, he figured that this means it's time to end my life. My ministry is over. I, there's nothing for me to do. I'm worse than my father's, so therefore I must just die. Listen, we can do the same thing. Uh, we can misinterpret our circumstances too. You know, for example, maybe you're having a hard time at work with your boss. Maybe you're having a hard time with your coworker. And that difficult situation that you're, you ha you're having at work, you're misinterpreting it. You're thinking God is telling you to quit. And God's not telling you to quit. You know, another example is marriages. Marriages that go through difficult times. They misinterpret that, that difficult time, that season of difficulty, and then they look at it and says, okay, I think God is telling us to divorce. And a lot of marriages today are broken up because of these squabbles within the marriage. And they misinterpret that, this, that circumstance in our marriage, that situation, that hard difficulty, that they think it's, well, this means that we're done. How do you know that? You don't know that. Listen, life is full of disappointments, Amen. I'm serious. I'm not here to kind of give you gloom and doom kind of thing, all right? <laughs> but I'm being real here. Life has its disappointments. If we are not careful, those disappointments can derail us spiritually. Keep that in mind. Those disappointments in life can derail us spiritually. There is nothing wrong with hoping for the best. I'm one of those guys. Nope, it's going to be great. You know, it's going to be good. There's nothing wrong with that. But when things don't go the way you want them to go, you have to somehow bear it, endure it as a soldier of Christ. Hope for the best. Maybe you're waiting for that job. They called you up twice. Hope for the best. But if you don't get it, don't sink. Don't be like, forget it. There is no God now. You know what I mean? Bear with it, endure it as a soldier of Christ and move on. Elijah here misinterpreted his circumstances. He figured Isabel, or Jezebel, not Isabel, Jezebel wants to kill me. Therefore, I need to get out of here. I'm done. God, kill me. Our circumstances can end up, when we misinterpret our circumstances, sometimes we can end up in places that we shouldn't be at. And that's exactly what happened to Elijah. Verse 4, notice what he said, take my life. He's asking God to take his life. God never answered his prayer. You know why? God, Elijah never died. Could you imagine if God answered his prayer and he's in heaven? It's like, you know what, Elijah? You asked to die. I, I killed you, okay? You're here with me. But you know that I actually ordained your life to never die? Are you serious, God? Uh, what? Are you I, I would I would have done that, right? I'm like, really? It's like saying, you know, you're telling God, kill me. He's like, you know what? I was going to involve you in the, in the rapture. Bummer. I want to I wanted experience the rapture. Well, you asked for to die, and I, okay, I answered your prayer. Listen, I am glad that God doesn't answer all of our prayers, aren't you? Seriously. I mean, we throw some crazy stuff, and then later on you're like, oh, I'm so glad he didn't answer that. <laughs> right? We've all been there, right? Elijah's asking for something, and little did he know God was not going to have him taste death. He was going to be taken up in this chariot, and it was going to be an amazing experience for him. But there are prayers that we ask God for, for and we plead with him and he doesn't answer and that's okay and maybe you've prayed that way maybe you've been in a situation in your life where you're just so down and you probably did say lord you can take me home you can take me home that's okay I, i'm just so depressed i'm so down right now lord I, if you just take me home right now I, I, it's, it's done i think a lot of us have prayed that and you're thankful that God doesn't answer that prayer because let's say later on you, as a, if you're an older person, let's say you experienced the, the birth of your grandchildren. And you're like, I'm so glad God never answered that prayer. Look how beautiful my grandchildren are. Or maybe you're a couple and you're just, ex you know, you're going to have children and you, now you have a son or a daughter and you remember, God reminds you, remember you asked me to kill you? Look what you have now. It's a beautiful baby. And you're like, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm thank you that you didn't answer my prayer because I have my, my son, my daughter. We can get very depressed. We can get very down. And we can have prayers like this, Elijah. But did you know that this reaction, this prayer, 
that, that people are asking for God to take them home or take them, you know, to kill them was a common occurrence in the Bible. Did you know that? By some big men of faith. Uh, let me give an example. Job prayed the same way for God to take his life. Now you're like, I would have done the same thing. Look what he went through. Then also we have Moses. Moses did the same thing. He prayed the same. Take my life, Lord. Jeremiah. See, all these guys were in ministry. It tells you that people in ministry are suicidal. No, I'm joking. But <laughs> <laughs> Choke in here. But you know what I mean. It could be kind of hectic sometimes. You know, I pastored a church for 10 years. There are some days I'm like, where's the rapture, you know? But we see here, though, that Elijah is so down, so down, so dark, that he even said, I'm no better than my father's. His, the fathers of Israel allowed the nation to fall into the condition that it was in when he was there. This is the whole struggle, is that this nation, they, they struggle with idolatry. And he's saying, I'm worse than them. It's like, wow, relax. Be easy on yourself. No, you're not. You're a man of God, but you have weaknesses, Elijah. But notice he provides. God provides for Elijah. Verse 5. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake, uh, a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down. I love this. You know why? It's because, see, the Lord understood that Elijah was a frail man. He needed food. And not only that, but we see that God provides for him because he was exhausted, he was depressed, and discouraged. And God is saying, I'm going to take care of this man. He's my boy, right? And, and I'm going to feed him. He needs some strength here. God understands that you're frail. Listen, when you're tired, don't think you're being unspiritual. Take a nap. God understands. I got to do ministry. I don't care, you know. Sometimes, you know, when I'm studying for a Bible study, when it's really late at night and, and my brain is like, done you know i don't i don't think it's like oh man i'm such an unspiritual man i gotta keep going till 2 a.m it's like i'm done lord good night you know that's okay god understands we need our sleep we need to, we need our rest we need our nourishment and god is taking care of him right here and he's giving him some interesting things and he sends an angel to him elijah wake up <laughs> right god sent ravens to feed you before birds now he's bringing you know angels to you and he's giving him angel food cake here. You know what I mean? That's what it says there. Angel, it was a cake, right? And some water, you know? You guys have had an angel food cake and water. You know that just, it tastes good, right? <laughs> but here he is, and the angel is giving him food. I'd be like, wow. I mean, at that time, I'm like, Lord, I mean, you used birds to feed me, and now you're sending an angel to feed me. This is pretty radical. And see, little by little, God began to kind of counsel Elijah. Little by little, he began to kind of wake him up, kind of wake him up from his spiritual darkness. And he is here, and here the angel touches him, and God was gentle with Elijah. God did not go in there and smack him around. Get up, you man of God. You're a Christian. You shouldn't be doing this, you know? No. God says, you're weak. I know you are. Let me feed you. Let me give you some strength physically before I deal with you spiritually. And this is what he's doing. Jesus is gentle, isn't he? Isn't he gentle? I mean, he is a gentle person. God will never come to you, even when you fumble, even when you mess up. The Holy Spirit will never come to you and say, you jerk, what kind of Christian are you? You know what? That's called condemnation. The difference between condemnation and conviction. Uh, condemnation says you I can't believe you did that. What kind of person are you? You say you're a Christian? That's condemnation. That's Satan. Conviction is, don't do this again. Repent. I love you. And God draws you back. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads people to what? Repentance. Not the harshness of God. Not the heavy hand of God. Can he smack us around? Absolutely. But he chooses not to because he loves you. He loves me. He's gentle with us. Let me prove it to you. Matthew chapter 11, verse 30. Jesus said this, for my yoke is what? Easy. And my burden is, you see how gentle Jesus is? Elijah, 
definitely had a burden on his heart, and the Lord right now is comforting him. He's comforting him. Verse 8, he gave him enough strength for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I find this interesting because it says there, when he says to him, uh, verse 6, he looked and there by his side was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down. Verse 7, and the angel of the Lord came back the second time, touched him and said, arise, eat before, uh, uh, because the journey is too, too great for you. So it says in verse 8, so he arose, he ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that, 40, of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. That's that mountain where God gave the commandments. But I want you to understand one thing. He says that he gave him enough food for 40 days. From the broom tree to Mount Horeb was about an, about an eight-day travel. 40 days. You know what that tells you? He was wandering for a while. And it's interesting because it echoes what the children of Israel did, right? They were wandering around, right? I mean, they could have been in that promise in a long time, but the Bible says they were actually circling around. They were just circling around. And sometimes you feel like that in life. You're just kind of circling. You're like, I have no direction, God. I, and it's like, well, what's going on? Let's, let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Maybe there's some sin in your life. Maybe there's something that's off in your life. And, and Elijah could have been there in eight days. It took him 40 days. But God understood that. He knew. He says, I'm going to give you enough strength for those 40 days. Instead of saying, I'm only giving you strength for eight days. And for the rest of it, you know, you will die then. But he didn't do that. God took care of his needs. And it says there in verses 9 through 10, as he says that he went from the broom tree, notice, to a cave. And there he went into a cave. He went into a darker place. And he spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now God gets more personal. He goes from a broom tree with a little shade to a place of darkness. And isn't that kind of what happens when life kind of kicks you in the teeth? You know what I mean? You, you become very discouraged, scared, dis so, so discouraged that you go from, from, from a place that's not as dark to a darker place. You get so down. You know, as, as I say, you know, people like that suffer from spiritual myopia. Uh, spiritual myopia is, is basically the, 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 the condition that you cannot see past your circumstances. It's like all you see in front of you are your circumstances, all the stuff that's going on. That's all you can see. You don't see beyond that. You're stuck, and Elijah was stuck. And it says here that Elijah was in the wrong place. Notice what God says. What are you doing here, Elijah? God always shows up in those discouraging times. You see, sometimes we think that God doesn't show up when we're going through a dark time in our life. We think that God is out somewhere else in left field doing his thing, and he's left us alone. But listen, even in those discouraging moments in your life, even when you're scared, depressed, that's when God shows up. And we see here, this is a great example. Elijah was in a place that he probably never thought he would be. And it's important that he understood that God was there. But he was in the wrong place. And I always say that it's important to be where God wants you to be. It's always important to be in that place that you know God has called you to be. You know, when Moses was leading the children of Israel, one of my favorite verses in that whole journey of Moses is Exodus thirty-three, fifteen. 15. He, he was real with God. And he said this, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from there. That's pretty cool, right? Have you prayed that before? Lord, if you're not in this, please don't open this door. I remember saying that before I moved to New York in 98. I remember walking. I, was, I, was, I, I remember I used to go jogging out in Ayala School when they came up with that school, and I would go on the track and jog. And I remember months before we left to New York to plant a church, I used to say to the Lord, I remember walking saying, Lord, if I am making a mistake, if you're not going with us, don't let us go, please. I don't want to move across the states and find out that you never came with us. Not, and, and I'm speaking in a, human tr in a human way. I'm not saying that God is go you know, away from us. He's with us all the time. But what I'm saying is as far as his will for us to be in a certain place. And Moses said, Lord, if you're not going with us, if your presence is not going with us, I don't want to go. Elijah was in a place that God did not call him to be at. And God will ask you the same question. What are you doing here? He'll ask you the same question. What are you doing here? Maybe it's a relationship that you're in right now. And God says, what are you doing in this relationship? 
It's not honoring me anymore. It, it's causing you to stumble. What are you doing here? Or maybe it's a different location. Maybe you're in a different place. Then God is saying, I've never called you to this place. Or maybe you're in a discouraged time right now in life. And God is telling you, what are you doing here? Why are you discouraged? You know, maybe you thought you were doing the right thing, but now you find yourself in a place of discouragement and fear. But the cool thing is that God is there with you. That's the cool thing. He's not going to leave you alone because you're his child and he loves you. God wasn't done with Elijah. He was not done with Elijah. Elijah may have thought that, that it was over, but God didn't want him to be afraid of Jezebel God did not want him to run away into the desert and end up in a dark cave. God did not call Elijah to live in a cave, but to stand up for the Lord. That's what he wanted, to stand up for God. Christians shouldn't live a defeated life. We shouldn't live a life of defeat. The Bible states that we are more than conquerors, right? But there are a lot of Christians today living in defeat. And God is saying, I'm not, I haven't called you from that. You need to live in victory. Christ, look at my son. Look what he did for you. And we are more than conquerors, the Bible says. We shouldn't fear man. We should fear the Lord, right? Elijah feared man, the woman Jezebel. So what does Elijah do? Verse 10, he answers God. Notice, he says to the Lord, Well, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, tore down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Well, Elijah answers the Lord, but he gives him the wrong answer. God is not asking him for all of this. Elijah is saying that there's no one else to maintain your cause, God. Everybody's dead. I'm the only one, and there's no way I can take this anymore. Elijah forgot about God's sovereignty, that God is not dependent on no one. He's not dependent on no one. Even though he chooses us individuals to do his work, He's not dependent on people. He can use angels. He was using an angel right there with Elijah. He could have sent his servant to look for Elijah to say, hey, go tap him on the shoulder and give him some food. No, God says, I'm going to provide an angel for him. I don't need man. I don't need people to be used. But, but he gives us that privilege to be used. And we see that Elijah is answering to God, and he's just basically oblivious to the sovereignty of God. And at that time, of course, he's so in darkness that he doesn't understand or see beyond that. So what does the Lord do? Well, once the Lord talks to him in a personal way, now God moves in even in, e in an even uh, uh, powerful way. Verse 11, notice what God does. He reveals himself to Elijah. He says this, Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great and strong wind, tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. The Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. This is one of my favorite sections in Scripture. What is going on here? I don't know. No, I'm joking. I do know. <laughs> when you look at something like this, you're like, wow. Three pheno phenomena, wind, earthquake, and fire. Elijah, listen, Elijah was used to seeing the spectacular. He saw fire come down from heaven. He was used to seeing God, his presence come in these spectacular ways. Fire from heaven. And God revealed himself through strong wind, the Bible says, even in the Old Testament. He revealed himself through earthquakes. When the people at the base of the mountain were looking up and Moses was up there, there was thunder and lightning and a great earthquake. Basically, the mountain shook, the Bible says. So God's presence was seen through these amazing phenomena. And you're like, wow, this is crazy. But God says, I was not in the wind. I was not in the earthquake. I was not in the fire. And notice what he says. I was there in that small, still voice. God revealed himself to Elijah in a faint, whispering voice. What does that mean to Elijah? Here's the lesson. That the Almighty God was quietly, sometimes un, uh, uh, unnoticeably doing his work in Israel. God did not have to show himself in the spectacular to prove to Elijah that he was still there. You get it? 
And it's interesting because a lot of times as Christians, when we want God to speak to us, we're waiting for a thunder, don't, aren't we? Or a tr trumpet blast. God, if you could just, you know, cause lightning to fall upon my house, you know, whatever, you know what I mean? Something, yeah, probably maybe that, it's not a good one, but you know what I mean. <laughs> if I hear this in Chino Champion, you know, I'd be like, all oh, these people's houses, you know? I'm like, whoa. Um, but, but Elijah was used to seeing all this, but as Christians, sometimes we want to see the spectacular. But listen, God will speak to us in that small, still voice. And you know where that is found? In the Bible. You just open up the Bible, and as you read a verse, God speaks to you right there, right? The Bible doesn't levitate up and go, whoa, okay, you're speaking. Yep, that's it, Lord. Okay, put it down, you know? He doesn't do that. You're, you're, you're having your quiet time, cup of coffee, you know? It's quiet. Everybody's still asleep. You're downstairs or upstairs, whatever you're doing outside, and you're reading the scriptures, and all of a sudden, a verse hits you hard in the, in, in the heart. And you're like, oh, this is amazing, Lord. Thank you. That was God's small, still voice speaking to you. But it's still powerful, isn't it? Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that the word of God is active. It's alive. It's powerful. And even though you didn't receive it in fire, in wind, or in an earthquake, listen, it is the same powerful impact that God spoke to you as if it was through those different things. Elijah didn't see God manifest himself in the realm of the spectacular, but that didn't mean that God wasn't working in Israel. God was fully aware of Jezebel's wickedness, and in fact, he did deal with her. He ended up destroying her. But don't get discouraged if you don't see God doing a work in your unsaved family that you've been praying for for 20 years. It doesn't mean he's not working in there. He is. Maybe you're one of those uh, that, 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 you know, people said, man, I prayed for you so many times and I just thought God wasn't doing anything. You know what? He was. He was convicting me. Every time he said something about Jesus, man, I just almost threw up, you know? It's like I was getting convicted. See, God was doing something. You just didn't see it. And as Christians, we get discouraged. We're like, man, you know, it's just I don't see God doing something in this life. Listen, he is. Trust me. But, but don't misinterpret that to think he's not because they look at you with a straight face when you tell them about Jesus. God is doing something in there. That's what happened with Saul in Acts chapter 9, or verse actually chapter 7 and 8, when he saw the death of Stephen, something was happening in Saul's heart. Because in chapter 9, we see him saved, right? And all the Christians at that time said, Saul is basically the Hitler of, of, the, of Christianity at that time. He hates us. He wants to kill us. And then he gets saved, and people didn't even believe it. Remember Ananias? Uh, Lord, you know who that is you want me to go to? He doesn't like me. So go, lay hands on him. He's blind. <laughs> okay. And they find out he got saved. So don't ever think that because you don't see any visible change in your unsaved family, that God is not working in them. He is. And this is what's happening with Elijah. Elijah see, hears God's voice, not in the, in the spectacular like he has before, but in that small, still voice. So verse 13, God after that comes to Elijah once again and says, when he heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, as reverence, of course. He just covered, him, covered himself. Went out and stood in the en at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said again, what are you doing here, Elijah? Don't you love the Lord? He doesn't give up on us, huh? W what are you doing here? Oh, no, 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 no. All right, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, seriously. God is so awesome. Elijah is asked by the Lord again, so what does the Lord do? He recommissions Elijah. Basically, Elijah, I'm not done with you. I'm not done with you, dude. It's time to go back and look at verse 15, what it says. Then the Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Assyria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, and king over, uh, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of, of Abel Mehola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Wow. You do have more work for me, Lord. That's cool. But he says, and by the way, Elijah, you know how when you said that you're the only one? Well, let me, let me give you a little revelation. Notice what it says in verse 18. I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to bow and every mouth that has not kissed him. Oh, 
So I am not the only one, Lord. This is great. Uh Uh-huh. I'm doing a work, Elijah. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean I'm not working. Okay? And guys, be careful. Seriously, be very careful. Just because you don't see anything visible doesn't mean God is not working, even in your own life. Maybe you're thinking, like, I just don't feel like God is doing anything in my life. I just don't feel. Listen, don't go by feelings. Yeah, Christian faith is an, a, it, it, it's an objective faith, not a subjective. It's not based on feelings. Uh, the Bible says in Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you, what? Will complete. It's a promise. That means that God is working right now in your life. He's working right now as I'm talking to you. He's doing a work in you right now. And just because you don't feel something doesn't mean he's not working in your life. He's promised that he is, and he's going to complete whatever he's doing in your life till the day of Christ Jesus. That's the promise that we have. And this is what God is teaching, teaching Elijah. And God comes to Elijah, asks him the same thing, and then he recommissions him to go back. These three men mentioned here were involved in the destruction of Baal worship, showing that God was at work and was going to take care of the wickedness in Israel. God used them. And Elisha took his place. Elisha took over the ministry of Elijah. And we see here that God even said, anoint Elisha who's going to take your place. So yeah, your ministry is coming to an end, Elijah. And Elisha will take over that ministry. So anoint him because you need to prepare for him. I want to close with a few things here as we come to a conclusion. Elijah's struggles show us that even men of great faith go through seasons of discouragement and disappointment. But it also shows that for us, there are times that the craziness of life can push us to want to quit, can push us to want to run away from our situation. Like I said, maybe it's work. Maybe you, you're, you want to run away from your job right now. You're like, I cannot stand this place anymore. I want to run. Maybe it's a relationship. You feel like, you know what? I need to leave them. This is not good. Or maybe you feel all alone in your relationship with Jesus. All your friends went back to the world, and you're like, God, I'm the only one here serving you now. Maybe you feel like Elijah. You feel like, Lord, I am done. Take me. You know, once one person said this, that life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. And I find that true. Elijah reacted rather than responding to God. You see, this could happen to us. And, and the way we c- it could happen to us is that we sometimes often react rather than respond by faith in what God is doing. We react and run. God wants to encourage us tonight that he's here for you. He's here for you. And wherever you're at in life right now, whether you are in a cave, if you will, or under a broom tree where there's a little light, God is there with you asking the same question, what are you doing here? And I find this very important and very interesting for us because Elijah, who had a truly mountaintop experience with God in the past, but yet he was not prepared for the valleys that always follow. He was used to the spectacular. He wasn't used to the valleys. And you got to be ready for those valleys. Don't ever turn your eyes or a blind eye to valleys because they do come, unfortunately. But there's a promise when you're going through your valley. Psalm 23, 4 Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. That's why. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Isn't that awesome? That in my valley, in your valley, God is there with you. He doesn't leave you alone. He's like, oh, you're on your own. No, I'm right there with you. That means that God is found not just in victories, which is awesome when he's found in victories, but he's also found in our valleys, discouragement depression, and disappointments. He's there. He's found in those states of minds and in those places in life. I love what David said in Psalm 42, 11. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise him and the help of my countenance and my God. The help of my countenance and my God. So God is asking you that question tonight. What are you doing here? Maybe your life is not where it should be tonight, and you know it. Or maybe you didn't know it, and tonight you're like, I'm in the wrong place. What am I doing here? What got me here? God is calling you to go back, to go back to where you started, 